Amen. I wonder if you'd turn to Matthew 25. Keeping in mind as we read this, this is the hour of preparation. Preparation for the meeting of the bridegroom. And the scriptures inform us that it's our responsibility, each of us as individuals, to make sure that we are prepared to make sure that we're ready to meet him when the cry goes forth. We're informed in Revelation 19, I believe, verse 7, that we are to rejoice and be glad because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. It's our responsibility to make sure we're ready. And in one of the parables, Jesus stresses the importance of making sure we're ready to meet him when he comes. When the cry goes out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And that is the parable of the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25. The foolish five and five were wise. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom, and five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, they that were prepared, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the sun of man cometh. Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, is one of the most solemn admonitions of our Lord in all of Scripture. Solemn because it shows that they were all virgins. They all had lamps. And yet to five, half of them, he said, I don't know you. You see, Jesus in this parable, as he does in several others, warns us of the need of being ready to meet him, his unexpected return. In fact, over and over he warns, admonishes, and teaches how essential it is that we make sure that we've prepared ourselves to be ready for his unexpected return because he says, I'll come as a thief in the night. Now, a thief never gives himself away or he isn't a thief. He's in jail. He was a thief. So Jesus warns that it's our responsibility to make sure we're ready at any moment, any hour of the day, even while you're asleep. Because, see, these were asleep. It's all right to be asleep. You have to sleep sometimes. Not asleep spiritually, but in the parable, they were all asleep, even the wise ones. So he may come while you're asleep. And if he considered his warning Well, it must be about 2,000 years ago, so important that we drop everything and give heed to make sure we're prepared, then how much more significant is his admonition with every passing day and every passing hour? I mean, it's even more significant today than it was yesterday or a month ago or a year ago or 2,000 years ago. Now, in this parable, he uses the illustration of a Jewish wedding ceremony, and it was generally the custom for the wedding to be held at the home of the bridegroom's father, and a procession would get together and accompany him and the bride from her home to where the wedding would take place. 
But of course we know what the symbolism is here, that Jesus himself is the heavenly bridegroom, and all his professed followers are depicted here as ten virgins. Now the ten virgins, or the number ten, may be symbolical in the sense that it represents completeness, that is, all of the professed followers of Jesus down through the ages. I suppose that's why it's ten. These ten represent all of the followers of Jesus. And though they're ten, and it may represent completeness, it does not mean that they're all Christian, we might say. Even though this is before the cross, he's still pointing to Christians and non-Christians. Because they're all followers doesn't mean that they're all Christians. He isn't saying that because there have always been true and false people who follow Jesus. But the significance is, and I don't know if you've ever caught it in studying or reading this parable, is that in outward appearance they all looked alike. Amen. And we're reminded here of another parable of Jesus, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now I don't know about you, I'm no farmer, but I think I know a little bit about wheat and tares. And the significance of Jesus using that illustration in another parable is to show us that we can't tell the difference. You know, the disciples in the parable, some wanted to root up the tares. He said, no, lest you root up some of the wheat with it. He says, let it go until the end of the age, then I'll send forth my angels, and they will reap, and gather the wheat into my barn, and cast the tares, bundle them up, and cast them into the fire, into everlasting fire, to outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But you can't tell the difference between a wheat and a tare until it comes to the place the farmer goes forth to gather the wheat and it's found there's no fruit in the tear. And so everybody sitting here this morning looks alike to me, but they don't to him. Amen. Not necessarily. <laughs> I'll add that hastily. Not necessarily. You see, the significance is he's telling us that they all looked alike. He called them all virgins. That is, prospective bride of the bridegroom. And of course the figure is in the Old Testament days they could have ten wives. You know, not that God ordained it, but he did permit it. David had several. Solomon had several times several. <laughs> so we're to think of all of us as the bride. That is the professing bride. And the significance is they all look alike here in this parable. He calls them all virgins. That is, they all look like Christians. They're calling themselves Christians. All of them have an invitation. All of them have lamps in their hands. And the lamps are burning. And so the thing that makes the distinction this morning between you and a true disciple are you and a false disciple, that is a professing one. You see, you fit yourself where you belong there. The thing that makes the difference between the five foolish, the foolish five, and the wise five was something else. It's verses 3 and 4. He tells you exactly what it is. It's not the outward appearance. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So you'll notice here that in outward appearance, all the virgins looked alike. They all professed to be friends and followers of the bridegroom. And notice too, and this is very important, they all carried lamps. So what's the difference in the two groups? What made five wise and five foolish? The thing that made the difference is the foolish five went forth unprepared. This is the hour of preparation. I mean, you don't have tomorrow to prepare. This is the hour of preparation. And even with the message, God is trying to prepare your hearts. The thing that made the five virgins wise by their possession of it made the five others foolish by their lack of possessing it. They all had lamps. All ten were virgins. All looked alike outwardly. They all professed to be followers of the bridegroom. They all had an invitation. They all had lamps. They all had oil in their lamps. Their lamps were burning. But they did not have oil in their vessels. You know, your heart, your life, preparation in the Word, the faith message, crucified life, deeper life message, preparation. 
submitting and not giving up in time of trial, not walking by faith as long as it doesn't cost you anything, not giving up because you hurt somewhere and you thought you were healed. But you say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That he can't change. Men change. Men change by how they feel. If they feel good, then they're healed. If they don't, they're not. Charismatic men we're talking about. We know the rest of the religious world goes by feeling and by sight, but we're not supposed to. So the thing that makes the difference, dear friends, is that they had the oil of preparation. They all ten had lamps. That is, they had the lamp of church membership. They were all members of some religious body or they wouldn't be called followers of Jesus. But only five had something in addition to their profession, their lamp of profession, that would give them light, give light to their path when they needed it. And that was the vessel of oil filled with the preparation they'd made. And you can have the lamp of profession of faith in Jesus Christ held high for all the world to see. You can have a lamp of church membership. And I don't mean some formal thing. By your identification here, you say, I'm a member of this body. You can have that lamp held high for all the world to see. But if you're not making preparation, if you're just listening to sermons, that isn't making preparation. If you're not making preparation, then you'll have no oil in your lamp when you need it, and you'll be counted as one of the foolish virgins. Oh, there are tens of thousands of people in the churches with their lamps held high for all the world to see. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Lutheran. I've got the true religion, I'm a Catholic, or I'm charismatic, or I'm this, or I'm that, held high for all to see, but they have no oil in their vessels. They have no preparation in their hearts. They don't know the difference, most of them, between Genesis and Revelation without looking at an index. And that is literally true. That's no illustration. That is literally true. You say, turn to Hezekiah 38, and half of them will start thumbing through the Bible looking for the book of Hezekiah. <laughs> or you could make it even more obvious. You could say, turn to the healing passage for the church. And they wouldn't know the book, let alone the chapter, James 5. <laughs> well, I trust you don't think that's being critical. It's just being honest. That you can have the lamp of profession, charismatic profession or whatever, held high for all to see. But if you've got no oil in your vessel, you're going to be foolish. Count it as foolish. And when the door is shut, there's no way to open it after it's shut. And we read here, only they that were wise had oil in their vessels. They that were foolish took their lamps. They had the lamp. It lit their way to the place where they were to await and prepare, they had light to get there, but they took no oil with them. And Jesus is saying, as we started out by saying, it's our responsibility, yours, not just ours, and that's so general and indefinite we can forget it means us, but it's your responsibility, it's mine, to make sure we're ready. The very fact he calls five foolish means that it was their responsibility because he wouldn't have called them foolish. All had the invitation. All had the same opportunity. But five didn't take seriously the word that comes forth from this pulpit. Week after week, week after week, week after week, we are called, if no one else in this world is, we are called to be an example of faith and the deeper life experience, that there's something beyond the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And not all have heeded the voice or the warning. We know that. Now this parable tells us there are ten virgins, half wise, half foolish. And since ten represents all the followers of Jesus, and five, though they profess something, he said, I don't know you, is that teaching, is he suggesting here that half the church members are unsaved? He said half of them here were foolish, and they couldn't enter. <laughs> No, he isn't setting forth a percentage here, but I'll tell you one thing, at least half of them are foolish. He didn't say two out of the ten. He isn't trying to set up a percentage. That's his business, how many. But I know one thing, but the very fact, it suggests to me at least, the very fact that he said half of them were foolish and unprepared, at least half of them in the churches are not prepared. And Jesus knows more about it than I do, and I've pastored a number of churches, and I've spoken, and I couldn't count them probably. How many? 
And most that I've found in all of them, with no exception, are not prepared. Amen. Yes, if you want to suggest that half are unsaved, you'd be quite conservative. You'd have Jesus to support you in such a supposition because he himself said, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. What do you suppose he meant by that? What do you suppose he meant in Matthew 7? Not everyone that calls me Lord. He says many will. Many. M-A-N-Y. Many. Will call me Lord. Jesus. Savior. And he says, I will tell them I don't know you. You can't enter the kingdom. That's Matthew 7, 21, 22. Why well, he said that all through his word. Few there be that find it must mean there are few that find it. Few find their way into the kingdom. So don't fault me or criticize me if anybody, and I've had that privilege before, that blessing of being criticized because, oh, you talk like to somebody unsaved in this church, one woman said. As I've told you before, it was a church I pastored, First Baptist, and they were all unsaved. Every one of them. Wasn't anybody saved. Most of them left and the few who stayed came on a profession of faith, not baptized. Deacons and all. I didn't tell them, you know, that you're unsaved. They just came and made confessions of faith. I didn't say, you know, you're unsaved, you're unsaved. I don't know that. I just knew the whole church was unregenerate. I could spend the rest of the message proving that to you. If you've got any spiritual insight at all, you'd say, I agree. I don't see how you stayed there three and a half years. I don't either, except for the grace of God. They got out the place where it was a faith walk. Ten dollars a week income from that church when I got it. But praise God, he didn't send me there for ten or ten thousand. He sent me there to preach the word is what they didn't want. Oh yes, if you think that we come on strong about we think and believe that most in the churches are not saved, you better get right behind Jesus and read what he says. He says, straight and narrow is the gate and very few will find it. Very few. And many will call me Lord, but he'll say to them, I don't know you. And he said, here of the foolish five, half of these, he says, I don't know you. You know, it's a strange thing that if word went out today that there was another oil embargo, practically everybody in the churches would wish that you'd hurry and get done so they could rush out and buy oil. <laughs> store up. Everybody at least fill his tank. Why, they would exhaust the stations of this country in 24 hours, the oil, if word went out again. Because we went through one and there was really some hard places to get oil unless you had faith. Which we did and we found places open that weren't supposed to be and that sort of thing when we'd travel the country. But the point is, if word went out, everyone would drop everything to rush out and get oil. And yet people just sit back, even here, some of you, bless your heart, sit back with a complacency that defies description. When Jesus says the time's coming when there will be a spiritual embargo on oil, you won't be able to find it. The parable says they rushed out to buy, but they didn't have time. And people would break their necks, as it were, to rush out and get oil if we suggested there'd be another oil embargo. and seem completely unconcerned about the time is soon to come when you won't be able to buy this oil, this oil we're giving you, this oil of preparation. It's our responsibility to get it. Will you turn with me to Luke chapter 13? It's a rather solemn parable he gives here, but Luke 13 is going to encourage you to believe he meant what he said. If you think that's solemn, then let's look at Luke 13. Luke 13. The multitudes are following him. Let's drop down to about verse 23. Then said one of those, Lord, now look at his question. Some need to get awake to this closeness of the hour and the seriousness of the message. His question, Lord, are there a few that will be saved? Wonder why I asked that. He must have heard some of Jesus preaching. <laughs> One time in John 6, they all left him but the 12, and he said, one of you is a devil. He had 11 left. 11 left, that's what it says. 
So he said, are there a few that be saved? And notice his answer. Well, haven't you ever heard about the doctrine of election or whatever? No, his answer was, that's none of your business. You strive, strive. That means work at it. That not work for it, but you better work at it. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, not some, not a few, many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When? Just like in the parable of Matthew 25. When? Once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door. And like in that parable here again, they will begin to knock without, to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say, I know you not. Scripture proves Scripture. Amen. This is the parable being given an answer to a man's question if there are just a few that will be saved. He says, I'll know you not. I don't know from where you are. Then shall ye begin to say. He's talking to them, pointing to them. Then shall ye begin to say, Why, we've eaten and drunk in thy presence, and you've taught in our streets. Why, we came to faith assembly regularly. We partook of the communion. We heard the teaching." And then he will begin to say to them, I tell you, I know you not. I know not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye that are workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets enter into the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. Oh, won't that be a solemn, heart-rending, eternal message that a lot in the churches and in charismatic circles Amen. will hear. Just because people jabber doesn't mean they have the Holy Ghost or can speak in tongues. They're real tongues, but they're false people. Amen. When once the cry goes out, you see, you'll never be able to change those words. Why, there are multitudes in the churches that are going to hear those words. I don't know you. There are multitudes who give no evidence in charismatic circles that they're making any preparation. They say they're following the bridegroom. They've got lamps in their hands. But so many are like those of whom Paul spoke. They have the form of godliness. Outwardly, they were all virgins. They all looked alike. They have the form. They have the lamp. But he says they deny the power thereof. Now, he isn't just referring to the institutional church that literally denies the power of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, miracles, the supernatural for our day. Certainly he includes them who have the form and deny the power. But he's speaking to you, to me, to us as individuals, that we can have the form. He's telling us just saying we're Christians, just identifying ourselves with the virgin bride that that in itself does not prove that we'll be able to go in when the call goes out. All ten were invited. That isn't what distinguished between the five foolish and five wise. All ten were invited, but only five made proper provision. Only five thought his warning seriously enough to be heeded that they should make preparation. All of those sitting here this morning, hear the invitation. All of those who sit in the churches of Jesus Christ, wherever they may be, even the ones that are almost dead, the invitation's going out. The invitation isn't what gets you in the door. The invitation to prepare has gone out. But very, very, very few, including some here, have not dropped everything to give diligence to make sure of their calling and election. Second Peter 1.10 Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. God knows, we think, but you've got to make it sure. He knows if you are one of the wise virgins, we may think you are, but only you can prove if you are to yourself and to God and to others. Or very few give any evidence that they're making preparation. You know, the interesting thing here is the five foolish, the foolish five, they did not think they were any different from the wise. See, outwardly, they looked about the same. We've already said it. All called virgins, all following the bridegroom, all had lamps, all making a profession, all had an invitation. 
And the five foolish, they actually did not think they were any different because they thought they were supposed to get in. That's why they were knocking on the door. And how many times do we see people who think we are foolish with all of our preparation that we're making? The five foolish did not think they were any different, and they, of course, couldn't understand why the five wise were so busy, you know, getting oil and just storing up oil, filling their hearts with oil, filling their vessels with oil. They thought outwardly there's no difference in whatever they're doing. Well, I'm not interested in that. And how many think our preparation as a charismatic school, and that's what the Church of Jesus Christ is in the New Testament, I challenge you to show me any other picture of the Church in the New Testament but a school, a teaching institution. Why, that is so obvious that you'll fall all over yourself with proof texts if you just look them up. You'll stumble over them. It's a school. It's a teaching institution. Then they go out and evangelize you. Fivefold ministry prepares you for a ministry, Ephesians 4, 11, and 15. Yeah, that's what it says. It doesn't say what it does in the King James. It says what it does in the Greek. It says what the Holy Spirit said. Fivefold ministry is set in the church to equip you for a ministry. People wonder. You know, they'll come in here and just sit and wonder why some of you are so busily writing your Bibles out. Like somebody invited a girl once up here, a young woman, and she said after the service, she says, what are you all so busy about? Study, 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 and notes, and that's church. You know, that wasn't her idea of church. <laughs> they just don't understand, you see, that preparation is required to get in the door. Oh, I thought all I had to do was believe in Jesus as Lord. Well, go back and read the New Testament. Many shall call me Lord and not enter in him, but he that does the will of my Father. Only those. Five wise, five foolish. What distinguished the wise from the foolish? They prepared themselves for the darkness. So they'd have a light to see the way to the door. That's right. I haven't been out this year ministering because we're making radio tapes doing other things, but I've ministered a lot in Pentecostal circles. And I'm not talking about first-generation Pentecostals because they've been a blessing, their writings and so forth. I'm talking about these third- and fourth-generation Pentecostals that have absolutely no faith, know nothing about the Word. I had to reduce my messages to 30 minutes. Every time I went to a Pentecostal church, I could go anywhere else and preach for an hour, hour and a half, two hours. But I could not in Pentecostal circles, with maybe one exception, just one. I can just think of one. But he had faith in his heart. But I had to reduce them to 30 minutes because they went to sleep on me. I lost my audience because if you don't shout and scream and jump up and down and give them something they can feel... <laughs> And that is not criticism, it is truth. Whenever it's truth, it's not criticism. And I know from sad experience, and I finally got to the place where I quit taking any invitation in a Pentecostal church. Because there was absolutely no life, the message just fell on deaf ears. Faith, believe, not go to the doctor and all of that, you know, they couldn't comprehend that. And they didn't know what a teacher was. In one meeting, an eight-day meeting, the pastor got up every night and explained what a teacher was to his people. And then he introduced me. And he finally said about the middle of the week, well, he does speak for two hours, but it's all right if you're saying something. <laughs> but even he couldn't get over the fact that anybody could stand up for two hours and every night and talk about faith. I don't read anywhere in here where Jesus got a loudspeaker system and went about the streets. If you know your Bible, it says he'll be very quiet. That's a prophecy. His voice won't even be heard in the streets. He was a teacher. Teacher. T-E-A-C-H-E-R. Teacher. Teacher, Nicodemus said, we know you are come from God. Paul was a teacher. He wrote most of the New Testament. And people think our preparation, you know, they get a puzzled look on their face when they come here. What are you people doing? One fellow said, I just felt, you know, all by myself. Everybody taking notes and busy listening and absorbing the word. And all he could do was sit and twiddle his thumbs. And 
Well, he could listen, of course. We're not suggesting you have to have a pencil as long as you've got one in your head. <laughs> Multitudes who are making no preparation. The five foolish, like the self-made Christian today, thought and hoped that they could enter in and thought they would because they were following the bridegroom, thought they would because they had the lamp in their hand and held high for all to see. They were following him, friends. But following Jesus won't get you in the door. Amen. Judas followed Jesus. He said in Luke 14, it's another one of those passages that will bless your spirit and crucify the flesh. He said to the multitudes one day that just following him would not get them in. They had to forsake all except a man forsake all, he can't be my disciple. Except he hate his father, mother, brother, sister, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And on and on and on, unless he's willing to forsake all he has and pay the cost. Following Jesus, I could give you probably a dozen reasons why people follow Jesus, and none of them will get the door open by the reasons they're using. Now, you see, you can't be in the ministry for 25 years and not learn a few things. And I've discovered a lot of reasons why people follow Jesus. I'll give you one or two just to show you that we could give you maybe a dozen without any trouble. And one is people follow Jesus because it eases their conscience. <coughs> oh, yeah. You see, if they identify themselves with the body of Christ and that relieves them, they think of the responsibility of identifying fully with Christ which means forsake all, be crucified, total faith, walk deeper life, the whole bit, if you identify with him. And persecution, John 15. So, dear friends, some people identify themselves with Jesus because it eases their conscience. Their wives leave them alone. They look like they're awake and listening, but there's no fruit in their lives. And so we don't know, you know, unless we're following each of you individually around, and that's not easy to do when there are as many as coming here. Eventually we see there's no fruit, of course. We don't have to follow you because there's no fruit. We'll see that eventually, but your wife will leave you alone. She thinks you're saved too. Well, he goes to church. He's a good man. And you can turn that around. Oh, believe me, you can. We know of some men that ought to be here this morning, but their wives won't let them or whatever. Matthew 7, 21 and 22, not everyone that calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of God. He says, he that does the will of my Father. He didn't say following me, being in church. Another reason why some people follow Christ is because of the outward benefits they derive from identifying themselves with Jesus Christ or with the body. Jesus speaks of this in John 6. You could find a lot of reasons, just like I do, by looking in the Bible. He speaks of these people in John 6. He says, you're not following me because of the message you heard. He says, it's because I fed you yesterday. You got a free meal. John 6, you ought to read it. And so some people identify themselves with the body of Christ because, you know, it's popular today to be religious. I mean, it gives you business if you're a businessman. You've got the church that you can count on. Or it gives you a good standing in the community and the school and so on and so forth. Oh, there are a lot of reasons why people follow Jesus. But following Jesus is not sufficient to get you into the kingdom once the door is shut. You'll notice here that both groups of the virgins had done all they wished to do. That's the thing that struck me as I've studied this parable. They both did all they wanted to do. And I don't want to seem cynical this morning, but I want to say that there are probably people sitting here, if they knew Jesus was coming in 60 minutes, would not do anything different than they've done for the last 60 years or 20 years or however long you've lived. You see, they both did what they wanted to do. Whether the cry went out in an hour or a day later or a month later, the ten virgins did what they wanted. They made all the preparation they wanted. If you've counseled with as many as I have, there's some people, for example, don't want to be delivered. They don't want to get rid of their problems. They get attention this way. They're so immature spiritually and mentally and in personality-wise and all of that that they just have to lean on people as a crutch. And I say this to make a point because I wouldn't mention his or her name in the pulpit to embarrass them. 
But I ministered to a man for I don't know how long until I finally told him he's going to have to start walking out these promises and principles that we're teaching him himself, that we can only carry you so far. Every decision, I had to make it. Three o'clock in the morning, long distance, come down from some other state and all of that. Well, then he turned to others. I never knew where he matured eventually or not. I get a call a few days ago, same man. He's been with some group, they've been ministering to him, and they've turned him over to the Word. <laughs> Done all he can do. You see, he never changes. He never grows an inch. He's spirit-filled. Well, let's say he has a baptism because spirit-filled could leave the wrong connotation in the context. But he has a baptism. He's a Christian. Whatever preparation he's going to make, he's already made it after all this time. I'm saying, dear friends, if you read the parable very carefully like some of us have, you'll see that he's saying here they did what they wanted to do. It's our responsibility to prepare ourselves. And if they had known he would come in an hour, they would have made the same preparation, which was nothing. Or, as the five did, they prepared themselves. So at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. That means they tried to light them. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. See, they were lighted. But the wise answered, saying, And you know, if they're wise, then whatever they say is a wise saying, right? So the wise said to them, not so, lest there not be enough for us and for you. That's very wise. You try to share your preparation with others at the last hour, you'll be wasting your time, and the door may get shut while you're trying to help the person who was foolish and would not prepare. Think what you will of it. That's what they said. That there's not enough for both of us, but you go and buy from them that sell. Buy for yourselves. But while they went to buy, when they tried to make that last-minute preparation, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. See, suddenly the cry comes, Lo, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And all ten virgins stir out of their slumber and sleep and arise, and the five wise ones trim their lamps, light their lamps. All ten, you know, thought they were prepared, but the lighting of the lamps reveals things as they really are. That it reveals the five foolish trying to light their lamps, and you know why they can't? They didn't make preparation. It's just what we've been saying. They weren't ready. Virgins, invitation, lamps, oil in their lamps, had everything outwardly they needed. They did not prepare. They did not provide for themselves oil. You can have a lamp, you see, it'll give you no light if you don't have oil in it when the cry goes out. And so the wise virgins tell them here, said, no, we can't share the oil of preparation. That's something that's in your heart. That's something we've been doing. Our vessels are filled, but if we take out of ours, then we will be lacking. And they say, this is something that can't be shared. Go buy for yourself. Well, the meaning is clear, dear friends. No one can make preparation for you. I can't make preparation for this body. I can only make it for me. I can point you to where you can get the oil or how to prepare. Husband, wife can't have faith for you. That's what he's saying. Wife, your husband can't do your believing for you. He's head of the home in a scriptural home, yes. And he should lead in worship and faith and the whole bit. But he can't believe for you. He can believe with you, but not for you. And young people out there, the time comes, you know, when you have to get out from under mom and dad's providing for you, whether it's financial provision or faith or whatever. They can't believe for you. They can't prepare for you. I can't prepare for my wife. If she doesn't prepare, then she's going to be knocking at the door, and vice versa. Amen. I don't care how close you are in a marriage, you can't prepare, you can't fill the other's vessel with oil. Amen. 
That ought to be plain. And the foolish said, give us of your oil. They said, no, there wouldn't be enough for both of us. They said, go to them that sell. Well, who are they? You're looking at one. I'm looking at a lot of them. All of us who have the faith message, the deeper life message, the charismatic message, who live it and talk it and testify to it and teach it, we've got the oil. I've got oil for you this morning. I'm giving you some of it. Only you determine whether or not you're putting it in your vessel. Go to them that sow, those who have the ministry. Isaiah 55, 1 is an interesting passage. It shows us that the oil, the things that we need for preparation, is available to us now, but we never know when it will be cut off. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye and buy. And eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. That's the same thing he's talking about as, you know, get the oil. So the milk and the wine and the oil and all is free. You buy it, it doesn't cost you a thing. He talks about buying it, but you buy it by fulfilling your responsibility to take it up and put it in your vessel and be saving it up. And it's interesting, too, you know, in this parable that the advice the wise virgins gave to the foolish was good advice. They were wise virgins. They could give good advice. But it came too late. That wasn't their fault. Now, I'm going to say something that may shock some of your sensibilities, but it may be too late for some of you to hear my warning this morning. It just may be. What if he comes in an hour? You don't have time prepared. You're not going to get oil in an hour. What if he comes tonight? You're not going to get oil by tonight. The invitation's now. Oh, he that thirsts. Now, if you're not thirsty, you see, you'll not get oil. You won't even be looking for it. Are the few that be saved? He said, you strive with all of your heart to see if you can enter. Because many will try and they won't. Once the door shut. Yeah, I don't know. It may be too late. You do not get this oil of preparation in an hour a day. You don't have time, therefore, to decide whether or not you're going to accept what we're saying and maybe start Monday getting on your knees and asking God if it's His will if you prepare. You don't have time to do that. You have only time today to prepare. You don't have time tonight to prepare. He may come tonight. You only have time while you're listening. Say, all right, I'm drinking that in. I'll go home the rest of the day. Some of you need to get on your knees and get a pencil and paper and your Bible and get alone with the Lord. Say, now, Lord, give me a schedule. My business, my job, my family, my career, whatever. Here it is, Lord. See it? It's at the bottom of the page. There's my wife's name. There's my husband's name. And there's Johnny and Judy. Here's where I work. Or here's my business. You see that, Lord? It's at the bottom of the page. It's just a P.S. Now fill in what you want me to do to get prepared. Daily, in the Word, in prayer, fastings, preparation of your life. Developing faith. You can't get faith in an hour. How are you going to get faith by tonight if He comes? He may come while we're talking about it. Then what are you going to do? Yeah, I don't know if it's too late for some of you or not, because you see, he's going to come any moment. He says he is. All I can do is to tell you, if you have an hour or a day, you better get prepared this afternoon. Start on your schedule. No one can make that for you. Discipline yourself. Say, all right, Matthew 25 has to take place one of these days. It could be today. Oh, you know, it'd be a terrible thing for me to stand inside and hear you crying outside. Some of you sitting under a word like you've been sitting under in this body for so many months and years, some of you, wouldn't it be a shame? You can say amen and sila. <laughs> and yet that's just words. You know, it was the sound of the door closing in this parable that caused the five foolish, the ones I've called the foolish five, you hear all these musical groups, Jackson 5 or whatever. This is the Foolish Five. <laughs> they made some music when they heard the door close. And it was that that aroused their anxiety. And they rushed to the door and began to pound on it. Lord, open. Lord, 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 open. 
You know who it is, Lord? We've eaten in your presence. We've listened to your teaching. And he utters just four words. They're the most solemn words that you'll ever hear. In fact, you don't want to hear them. I know you not. If you're not making preparation, those are the words. I'll guarantee you on the authority of his word, those are the four words you'll hear. Even though you think you're in the kingdom, if you're not prepared, he said, I'll utter those four words that'll ring in your ears for eternity, Jesus said. I know you not. These five foolish thought they knew him, and he knew them. And those multitudes that call him Lord today think he knows them. He says, I don't know you. Why? Because you don't heed what my messengers say. You pick and choose. You say, well, I've got time to buy oil. And he says, you don't have time. When you've heard the invitation to buy once, that's the only invitation you'll get. Until you buy oil, you'll not get another. You may hear the words. But you have to go back to the invitation that he gave you to buy oil, prepare. Oh, there are a lot of places today and they're not telling people to prepare. But now you may be able to purchase oil today. I don't know. I really don't. God help me to practice what I preach. I mean that with all my heart because you can get so busy making radio tapes or whatever that, well, I'll pray. Let's see, if I just stay with this another hour, I'll get this tape done, then I'll pray. Then it's time to go to bed. Or time come to church. I make a tape every Wednesday before I come to service, which is another sermon. Don't judge what you see outwardly. I may get here about the time you start, but I wasn't home watching TV. <laughs> and anyway, I got delivered of caring about what people think about when I arrive years ago. My preparations in that study are at home or wherever on my knees. I got a vision in between services Wednesday. Yeah. Because I wasn't out here telling everybody how nice they looked and listening to chatter and not putting you down, but there is quite a bit of chatter that goes on between classes. You can do what you want, but I go pray. Five minutes makes a lot of difference sometimes. Maybe I get the insight I need when I get out here. I don't know I got it in there, but you get out here and there it is. You see, it just unfolds it. As one brother said last week, God's given you a gift of just putting things together so we can understand them. I said, I know that. I said, that's the gift he's given me. But you don't get it just by saying, Lord, give me that gift. I went on to say, I said, and much of what I get when I stand up here, I make preparation. I pay my dues. I make preparation. You better believe it. I start Monday on my four teaching privileges and responsibilities. I start Monday. I don't do anything else. I don't care if the world's coming to an end. I make preparation Monday. I don't wait till Tuesday. If I don't start on Monday, then Monday doesn't go right. doesn't go right in any way, mostly inside me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I make preparation, but I said it's when I stand up that he just enables me to see things. You're hearing it with a fresh insight or whatever. Even if it's the same text that you heard a year ago, if you listen with your heart and not your head, you'll find out God's saying something new, deeper, more to you. He knows when you can receive it. Well, I trust you'll never hear those words. I know you're not. Whatever you do about Christ's warning to prepare, you have to do today. Not tomorrow. Today. Because the five who are prepared will just rush off and leave you if the call goes out today. Is your lamp filled? You say, yes, look, here it is. I'm right here with all of you. I've got my lamp like you have. Well, the next question is, do you have any oil in your vessel? Oh, that's another question, isn't it? What if tomorrow you were challenged to give up your business, you businessmen out there, but you wouldn't have to if you just compromise a little? You'd find out whether or not you prepared, where you got any oil in your vessel, or enough. <laughs> oh, a lot of people have been <coughs> invited to leave work and churches, denominational churches and marriages and whatever because they get the Holy Ghost. Well, they found out where they had any oil in their vessel when the challenge came. Now, Jesus warned 
that this separation that takes place is going to be very, very solemn. He said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, gnashing of teeth isn't gnashing on people. You know, when anguish can be so great, you just gnash your teeth. Our frustration, our desperation, that's what he means. And this separation is going to be very solemn one day. It's going to separate husbands from wives. Wives will go in and husbands stand out pounding. That's my wife! Or vice versa. It's going to separate children from parents. It's going to separate friends from one another. Turn to Luke 17 in closing, and I want to show you again that he says precisely what we're saying. This is Luke 17, verses 26 and 27, that a separation between the wise and foolish is going to divide marriages, parents from children, children from parents, workers from one another. You'll be working and one will be separated from the other. Let's look at verses 26 and 27 first. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. It'll be just like it. What did they do? Well, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. What's wrong with that? Nothing. You eat and drink every day. Marriage and giving in marriage. Nothing wrong with it. Life was just going on as usual. It is his point. Nobody concerned about spiritual matters. No preparation. He said they were just doing what everyone else does until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Life went on as usual. How is it at your house? Is it going on as usual? Is your husband making preparation? Your wife? Your children? Your children come to church because you're required? Or are they making preparation? Now look at verses 34 to 36 and we'll see how this separation will divide right through families. I tell you, verse 34, that in that night there shall be two in one bed. Now that's a husband and wife. Amen. And one shall be taken and the other shall be left. These are the words of Jesus. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be working together in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Jesus said the ones that will be taken are the ones who are prepared to go. Amen. If the call went out today or tonight when you were fast asleep with your wife in bed or your <coughs> husband in bed, would your wife be taken and you left? That's what he said will happen here. Our wife, would your husband suddenly be gone and you left? Are a parent be taken and the children left behind? Or vice versa? You see, anyone who has not heard the call in this hour to drop everything and prepare has not heard the voice of the shepherd. Because the shepherd said, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. You never follow him without taking up the cross, getting in his word, living the life that he called us to. That's preparation. Preparation in all the ways that his word, his ministry, and his Holy Spirit will lead you to make. Would you stand, please? Father... Our prayer in this solemn hour is that each of us will give diligence to make his or her calling and election sure that we'll not sit back with complacency and take for granted because we're identified with an end time body, a body of faith, that we too have the oil in our vessels. We'll not be deceived into thinking because we have the lamp in our hand, that we can see that we have the lamp because of our own profession, because we may read daily Bible readings and pray a form of prayer and receive blessings from heaven. This means that we have the oil of preparation in our vessels. Our prayer this morning, Lord, is that each of us would examine his or her own heart, whether five or fifty, whether they're six years old or 60, seven or seven, eight or 80, whatever, 
man, woman, boy, or girl, young or old, that each of us will examine his or her own heart so that those of us who are prepared and who are preparing ourselves will not go in and hear the door shut upon them, that we might all, under the sound of the voice of the shepherd this morning, make sure that we follow him and pay the cost. The cost is so little to pay that we pay this cost, even if it's forsake family, friends, business, career, job, wife, husband, children. It's so little to pay to make sure that we have paid the price for the oil of preparation and are ready. God, help each Christian, help each Christian to know that he is one by his own examination of his heart. And those who may be hoping and thinking, Father, that you would awaken them to see that mere identification or profession with Jesus is not enough, but that we must go all the way, especially in this hour, this last hour, all the way, without any hesitation, without even looking back. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. We are, as far as we know, speaking to people who profess to be Christian. That's what the church consists of in the New Testament. But only you know your status before God. The thing is, you can be deceived because you have the outward form as the five foolish did of the ten. So the warning is, the call is, is not to be thinking that we're preaching a sermon to the lost, those who are unevangelized, that is, because we're going to do that, we'll get out on the street corner. This parable was given to people who professed Christ who were followers waiting to go into the marriage. So don't let the devil rob you of the seed that's been sown. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So as we lift our voices up in song and praise, why don't you just offer your heart fully to Jesus, and then go home and walk it out. And of course, if there is, as Paul says, or may an unbeliever come into our services, if that is true, then you have no invitation to the wedding feast, you have only an invitation to have your sins forgiven, first of all. And if you're without Christ, then give your heart as we sing to him. Lift up your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I believe I'm lost, I'm a sinner. I invite you in to cleanse me from my sins. Come into my life as Lord and Savior. I receive you as Lord, Savior, and Master. Then confess him and be baptized in his name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Teach me
Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen.